Okay, good, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a big, big welcome uh, to our Belgium session in the wake of the Belgica, Belgium Arctic journey. I must say this is really a, a premiere, as they say in good English. It's about the very, very first time that we have a Belgium delegation here at the Arctic Circle, and I'm very proud uh, that we are uh, having uh, this uh, session. It's uh, the panel, our aim is to, to demonstrate that Belgium uh, has a, a polar journey that is not new. It actually started already 125 years ago uh, with a very famous and the very first international research expedition from the Belgica uh, to Antarctica. And this panel will demonstrate that Belgium polar research is very well advanced, uh, if not already in some fields, world really reached uh, world class. And this panel will explain Belgium's ambitions, Belgium's activities, Belgium's achievements, but we will also demonstrate that our ambitious activities are embedded in the overall strategy of uh, the European Union with regard to the Arctic. So we have representatives here from different institutions, from the government, uh, think tanks, science communities, NGOs. And uh, with this, I would like to start our discussion. Um, we'll start with uh, Ambassador Frank Arnos, who is the Belgian ambassador to Norway and to uh, Iceland. And he plays a very dynamic role within the Belgian diplomatic mm -hmm. service on the uh, Arctic file. So my first question to you, uh, Ambassador uh, Arnos, uh, where you will represent the Belgium government's perspective is, why is it so important for Belgium to have its own a Belgium strategy and what are Belgium's key interests in this regard? Ambassador, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank, thank you, Marianne. Uh, first of all, thank you also to the Egmont Institute, who is organizing uh, this event. Egmont Institute is the think tank linked to the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And you are, are asked, the Egmont Institute was asked by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to start preparing a Belgian Arctic policy. And that's what you are doing with great enthusiasm and a very devoted Team and you organized this event together with the colleagues from from the International Polar Foundation and with the Arctic Institute, whom I thank as well. Yes, indeed, you mentioned uh, the term uh, polar policy, and and if Belgians hear the word polar policy, they immediately think about an Antarctica, because Belgium has a tradition of. Uh, 125 years of uh, an Antarctic expeditions and research, and we have also a permanent station on Antarctica. So uh, that is a well-established policy, well-established and recognized in, in expertise internationally. But over the years, of, over the recent years, we have, to, we have to come to the recognition that if we look what really has impact uh, on Belgium is maybe not in, in the most immediate way what happens on Antarctica, but rather what happens on the Arctic. And, and then we discovered then in a way that we had a kind of a blind spot, at least at the, uh, at the government policy level, uh, when it comes to Arctic policy. Uh, so, there has been a kind of um, bottom-up bottom uh, awareness-raising exercise. We, there are several um, Belgian individual stakeholders who are active at, uh, at, at the Arctic, but this has not really come true to the level of, of uh, government policy in development. One of the reasons uh, why this has not happened, uh, even if we have real uh, interest and, and responsibilities at stake in the Arctic, is probably has to do with, on the one hand, our geographic location and also how we respond to this geographic location. Belgium and our capital, Brussels, is, is this place where that northern Europe starts north of Brussels and southern Europe starts south of Brussels. And so we are, always have some difficulties 
whether we should focus on the south and should we focus on the north. And, um, and I would say in, in the latest decades, uh, also because we very often look at the world through European lens, we have been very much focused, I think, on, on, uh, on uh, global developments worldwide, but a, a slight focus, I would say, on, for instance, conflict management and other developments rather in, in the south. And we lost a bit out of sight what's happening in the north. And we trusted that if we look through the European lens and through the, the, three, through the, the Europeans, uh, European Union's action in, in the north, that Belgian interests would be covered. And that's also why we have a Belgian and a European flag here, and also why we have the EU special envoy at this table, because we still believe that we shouldn't invent, like we say in Belgium, the wheel or the warm water, so that we can embed our national Belgian policy and strategies on the Arctic in what the European Union and its member states have, have developed. But I think we should, we should go... Um, one, one step beyond. Like I said, the European Union is in the, medium, in the meantime, and, and I heard this all, all, all already yesterday in, in discussions and presentations, the European Union is well recognized as a significant player taking care of regional development, biodiversity, scientific research, and so on in the Arctic. But there are also national uh, stakeholders in Belgium, and there are national concerns which are not always covered uh, through the European Union. And the main example, perhaps, is, is, uh, cli is climate change and the melting of the ice. Belgium, like Netherlands, we are part of the low countries, and if the, the water is, is rising following the ice melt in, in the Arctic, we will be one of the first to notice this. So we, have, we better take care of that and also take care of that from a national interest. And, and on the other hand, we are one of the most industrialized countries still in Western Europe. We are still among the 15 biggest export and import nations in the world. So we produce an enormous amount of CO2 still, still in Belgium. So we are also are responsible for what's, what's happening in the Arctic and, and uh, through the emissions of CO2, what's happening on the melting of the, of the ice. So there's, for Belgium, both interest and their responsibilities, and that's also how we would like to to approach the situation in the Arctic. So the, to have, to find uh, to be more engaged in the Arctic, based on the recognition that we have concrete uh, concrete uh, interest and concrete responsibilities in dealing with the consequences of climate change. Like I said, we have individual stakeholders. We would have not waited for the Belgian government to develop an Arctic strategy or an Arctic policy. So we have, uh, for instance, um, Belgian science, Belgian polar science is very well developed. Two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we organized a Belgian uh, polar science uh, conference in Brussels where that more than 150 people participated and of, of which more than 100 Belgian scientists uh, focusing on uh, all kinds of uh, streams of polar uh, research, but Professor Heubrecht will, will develop that. So we definitely have something to offer to the Arctic in terms of scientific knowledge where we can say that at, at least taking Antarctica and Arctic together. We are among the leading uh, scientific circles for polar research. But also on, at the business level, uh, I, I can say that um, f f since the 90s, Belgium, and that's before the invasion of Russia in, in Ukraine, Belgium has been very actively involved in everything that has to do with an LNG uh, in, um, um, extraction transport and distribution of LNG coming from the Arctic through the rest of the world. That is an interest, but it's also, a, again, a responsibility because of all the, the CO2 that's coming from, from uh, this industry. So there's scientific interest, there's economic interest, and also, for instance, uh, our, our military participates regularly in military exercises for, in particular in Norway, but also in Iceland, in, in the framework of NATO, so showing preparedness and solidarity with the region. 
So taking all those, um, those interests and responsibilities uh, together makes it really worthwhile to come to this, uh, to this policy and strategy. And to on top of that, um, the Belgian Parliament has come to the same analysis as we did, and on the 6th of January, an almost unanimous Belgian Parliament has mandated or requested the Belgian government to develop a, a, a uh, Arctic strategy in the coming months and years, and even asked to be, uh, that Belgium should become an observer to the Arctic Council, for which the timing probably is not very appropriate. But I think updating this, this status is maybe not the, this, the top priority. I think the top priority is engagement uh, with the region, engagement and dialogue so that we can explain what we can do for the region. But also I think that we have to go really into dialogue what we can achieve together with, between the countries like Belgium and Western Europe and the countries in the north. We have a responsibility to, to, to reduce our emissions, for instance, but like in the country of Belgium, which has 65 kilometers of coast only, it's, it's difficult that we achieve our renewable targets just on our own. We managed, we will manage to produce 5.6 gigawatt of offshore wind energy in the coming years on 65 kilometers of coast, but even that will not be enough. So we are looking for, for instance, partners in the North Sea, in Norwegian Sea, but also higher up, up to the Arctic, for partners to achieve our renewable energy targets, amongst others. So there's definitely things to discuss, things to engage together and find solutions together for the problems we are faced with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. I think it's, it's very important what the Ambassador uh, underlined that our engagement and dialogue with the region will be one of the key uh, elements. Another key element of our Belgium future Arctic strategy, and uh, we repeat it at every uh, occasion, is that we wanted to have it embedded in a European strategy. We don't want to have some overlapping. Uh, we want to contribute to it, and therefore I'm particularly pleased that uh, at this Belgium uh, panel, which is also represented by the three Smurfs, do you call them Smurfs in English? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that we have here with us uh, Clara uh, Gansland, uh, who is uh, one of my successors, I, I would say, and extremely pleased uh, that uh, Clara took up uh, the job as uh, a Belgium as the European uh, Special Envoy for uh, the, uh, the Arctic, and I'm extremely pleased that, that uh, Clara is in this uh, major networking uh, conference. Uh, Clara, the question I would like to, to put to you is how do you see the role and possible added value uh, of individual national, national uh, individual EU member states engagement of, of the Arctic uh, in the light of the existing that you have an EU Arctic policy? So. What can an individual country bring to the file? Clara, you have a file. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Marianne. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a real uh, honor and privilege to be here on a Belgian panel. So I suppose this makes me an honorary Belgian. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also having here the EU flag. So um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And, um, I think it's very important to, to highlight the complementarity in the engagement between the EU and its uh, member states. Um, and Belgium's decision to get more involved in Arctic matters is uh, relevant, it's welcome, and it's really, I think, a sign of the time. Um, and as you mentioned, Marianne, it's, it's uh, very much supportive of the EU Arctic policy and this is of course very welcome that the member states um, fully stand behind and that we do this together and it's all going in the same direction with, with the same goals. So this support of engagement from our EU member states is of course very important. Now um, many of our EU member states have uh, published strategies, policies, uh, papers that set out the national views um, relevant to the Arctic and relevant to the regions. Um, uh, of course, the Arctic states, the, the member states uh, that are Arctic states, but also others with uh, long-standing engagement, uh, which is 
relevant, and also more recent ones. And we have heard here the past days, for instance, um, Estonia, Ireland, uh, and others. So I, I think this really illustrates the, um, the broad and growing interest. Um, common priorities of EU and EU member states, um, I think one can see as red threads through, through these different uh, national views. And I would say highlighting the, really the, the interest in promoting uh, peaceful, stable, sustainable development in the Arctic. Um, and also the importance of well-functioning international cooperation to deal with the challenges um, and the involvement of local people and respect for the rights of indigenous people. So people, peace, climate, creation of green jobs, and of course, Arctic science and research is critically important uh, in, in, in all of this. So, um, Regarding Belgium's uh, engagement here, I, I would say that this reflects the science um, about climate change as the most uh, comprehensive global challenge that, that we are faced with. And in this field, uh, Belgium has a long-standing and renowned capacity, which I think we will hear much more about in the next interventions. So uh, I think this replies to your question about the real added value. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Many thanks, uh, Clara. I think it's important that you uh, underlined the complementarity uh, of our uh, efforts working for, for the good uh, of uh, the Arctic uh, together. Uh, my, my next speaker in the panel is uh, Professor Philippe Heubrechts, who is professor at the University of Brussels and Belgium representative of the International Arctic Science Committee. Um, uh, Belgium just became a member uh, of uh, the International Arctic Science uh, Committee. And uh, therefore, uh, Professor Heubrechts, I would like uh, to start uh, with the question, why actually uh, did Belgium apply to become member of the International Science uh, Committee? And why is it so important that you succeeded, for which my congratulations? Yes, uh, thank you, Mrs. Chair. And uh, indeed, uh, Belgium was accepted as the 24th member earlier this year in March. And uh, to some extent, this was uh, long overdue, given the fact that uh, Belgian scientists have been active in Arctic research for uh, many decades now. And uh, the wish of the uh, Belgian research community uh, to become more closely involved in scientific networks on the Arctic, for which I ask, and the International Arctic Science Committee plays a coordinating role. Of course, uh, Belgium is not uh, an Arctic nation, but uh, as it has been mentioned before, there is a long tradition in Belgium of uh, polar research dating all the way back to the end of the 19th century uh, with the overwintering on the Belgic uh, of uh, Adrien de Gelache, and then Belgium was also one of the uh, original signatories of the Antarctic Treaty. So for a long time, polar research was uh, very much focused on the Antarctic, but in the last few de decades, polar research gradually shifted also to include the Arctic. And the motivation for that was mainly climate change and the uh, impact of climate change on the ice, uh, on the environment in the Arctic, and also uh, indirectly on, uh, on sea level rise. Yeah. And Belgium, uh, as it has just been mentioned, has a coastline and uh, low-lying areas. So the, the Belgian research groups that are active in uh, Arctic research are in fact uh, largely the same ones that are active in uh, Antarctic research. And they often use the same approach, approaches. And um, in a survey that we conducted uh, before we applied, it appeared that uh, at Belgian universities and uh, institutions, there are 12 groups uh, based at uh, different, uh, eight different Belgian universities active in uh, uh, Arctic research. And uh, their activities cover, in fact, a very broad variety of disciplines and subjects, and uh, involve field and laboratory studies, uh, participation in cruises uh, in the Arctic, uh, and also uh, specific for Belgium, uh, including a very significant contribution from geophysical and biogeochemical modeling. And over the 
last seven years, since 2015, we counted more than 190 publications in uh, uh, international peer-reviewed journals on Arctic science in almost all of the domains covered by the five IASC uh, working groups. And the majority of these uh, papers, in fact, uh, were situated in the field of uh, cryosphere and atmospheric sciences, but there were also substantial contributions from uh, marine and terrestrial sciences. But apart from that, uh, Belgian Arctic research is already today well embedded in international efforts on polar research. Uh, Belgian teams participate in projects within the EU polar cluster, and such as uh, EU PolarNet, uh, PROTECT, which deals with uh, sea level change, uh, Nunatariuk, uh, a project on permafrost, and uh, uh, there were also Belgium teams inf involved in Applicat. Uh, it's uh, recently concluded, which was a project on polar predictions. And uh, besides, Belgian scientists are also active in polar science groups, uh, such as ESMAS, which are sponsored by IASC, and uh, Belgium has been uh, a, a long-term member of the European Polar Board, uh, which also has uh, an important Arctic uh, uh, leg. So clearly there was uh, a large interest in the Pol Belgian Polar Research Community to join the International Arctic Science Committee. And in a sense, it complements our long involvement that we have had uh, since many years in SCAR, uh, which is the uh, Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research and, in fact, the counterpart uh, for the uh, Antarctic. And the, the interest for us is that it means uh, access to, uh, to new networks and uh, opportunities for uh, new collaborations, and it's a way for us to uh, uh, consolidate and further expand our research activities in the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hoebrek. So we, we can already profit from 125 years of polar research, and now we have this new avenue uh, with the, the science uh, committee. My next speaker is um, Nicolas van Hoeke, who is the manager, managing director of the International Polar Foundation, IPF, which is specially known uh, for managing the Princess Elizabeth Research Station in Antarctica, which is the only uh, zero emission uh, station in Antarctica. And as at this Arctic Circle, we have been dealing with royalty. We have uh, to inform you that we have Princess Elizabeth, uh, who has given her name to the Princess Elizabeth Research Station in Antarctica, and that the same uh, Crown Princess Elizabeth only a few months ago baptized uh, the famous vessel, the Belgica. So with this word, Nicolas, you have the floor, and I will ask you the question, why is Belgium a polar nation? Thank you very much. Um, we are, I don't know what the definition is of a polar nation, but uh, we are very focused on polar research, polar presence, polar expeditions, despite our very small size, of course, as a country, and the fact that we are you know, not very close to any of the poles, being the Arctic or Antarctica. Replying to your question is not easy um, because I've, not, I've, I've looked, but I've not seen any scientific paper about why Belgians are so involved or active in these regions. Now, my, my take on it is that historically we have been subject to different influences, different people, different you know, uh, cultures throughout our history, and I think it is ingrained in who we are as Belgians. We always look for exchanges, exchanges whether it's cultural, economical or, or scientific. And this leads to me, this leads inevitably to, to traveling, to exploring. And I think there's plenty of evidence of Belgians going around the world and discovering new, new places or you know, discovering new, new cultures. And that is valid also for the polar regions. Now the International Polar Foundation that I lead with uh, its founder, Alain Hubert, is focusing, as you said, on most of these activities for the moment at least are with the Princess Elizabeth Antarctic Station in, in the Antarctic. So I cannot speak too much about the Arctic region, except that Alain Hubert has in the past, of course, done exhibitions, exhibitions, sorry, expeditions uh, in the north, and we help people uh, to go there as well, with advice and with material. I think um, it cannot be overstated how much uh, the Belgian exhibition expedition, I'll, I'll get there, 
without mistakes, expedition mm -hmm. of 125 years ago, of, uh, Adrien de Gerlache, has really had an impact on the discovery of, of uh, Antarctica. So just as a brief, because I'm trying to give, trying to give you a crash course in Belgians in Antarctica. Um, very, in, I think I have one minute and a half left. So it's very linked to the international geophysical uh, years, right? The first one was, I mean, the, the one that was important for us was 1895, where scientists were invited to discover Antarctica. And so there's this young guy, this young Belgian guy who decided, I'm gonna take a, a, a plane, I'm gonna take a boat. I find a team, an international team, mostly with Belgians, but also with people like Amundsen and Cook, you know, who were on the same team and go down. Uh, why is it so important, uh, this, this first expedition of uh, Adrien de Gerlache? is because they, and I think the ambassador already mentioned it, they did the overwintering. It's the absolute first overwintering of people in Antarctica, which allowed them, of course, they, they were not living in, in, in luxury. We have plenty of books, if, if you're interested, to read about their adventures. Um, but it was the first time that it was a really scientific expedition that they were able to collect uh, scientific data for many months in a row, one year of meteorological data. So there are many firsts, and that was the kickoff for Belgium and the adventure in Antarctica. I'll, I'll go quick, really quickly, but the Gerlache family had two other people in 57, 58. Uh, his son, uh, Gaston de Gerlache, went there as well and kicked off a series of Belgian expeditions to um, Antarctica. And you mentioned uh, the, our current station, Princess Elizabeth, but we had a station before already, uh, which is Roi Boudouin, also in Antarctica. Uh, another de Gerlache went in 73. And in order to celebrate the 100th, so this year, next year, we celebrate the 125th anniversary of that overwintering, important milestones. Um, for the 100th anniversary, the founder of uh, the International Polar Foundation decided to cross Antarctica uh, with his um, friend, Dixie Dansoku, who unfortunately left us uh, about a year ago, uh, by foot. So they, they traveled 3,900 kilometers in, in 99 days. And I will end this crash course, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with the as important uh, international year, was the International Polar Year in 2007, 2008, where Alain Hubert had this, this crazy and ambition, I, ambitious idea to say, I'm going to create what you mentioned, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, a zero emission station. I'd, li I'd love to have a few minutes maybe later on to discuss about the, the station, um, but it was his ambition. And so this station was inaugurated in 2009. Since then, we welcome people uh, from Belgium, but also from, from all other countries to do scientific research every year. We give them a platform, zero emissions. This is my PR talk. Um, and since then, actually, we have uh, continue to grow to improve the station. We have many more projects upcoming. It's a bit too early to discuss it. But I think this gives evidence of the, the vision and the ambition that Belgium has in the polar regions. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. Uh, I also would like to add that the International Polar Foundation is every year organizing the, the Arctic Futures Conference symposium. Uh, in Symposium in Brussels. It will take place this year on the 29th and the 30th of uh, November. And I know already here several people in the publicum uh, who will be uh, participating. So we are looking forward also uh, to your visit to Brussels uh, later on. Thank you for the promotion. <laughs> Uh, the next speaker is, is Romain Jouffard, who is a, a, a leadership member of the Arctic uh, Institute. And uh, Romain, he wrote uh, last year in 2021, he wrote a very interesting article, which is entitled, Is Belgium the next near Arctic state? So Romain, what is your answer? Thank you. Uh, first of all, Marianne, thank you so much. And thank you, Egmont, for organizing this panel alongside the Arctic Institute and uh, the International po Polar Foundation. The article title is obviously a bit tongue in cheek. Uh, we've learned that there's no such things uh, as a near Arctic state. Um, the status is in existence, it's been tested by the uh, eight. Uh, the A8 uh, who have uh, sovereignty in the region. Um, However, the question then becomes, if we think about Belgian engagement in Arctic governance, how can Belgium be regarded as a good faith actor uh, in the region? So, as a, because we've heard, we've had the, we have the capacity, we are Arctic relevant, but how can we be seen as uh, being, not using this term, near Arctic state, but being uh, acting in good faith? And of course, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. 
uh, we can learn from other non-Arctic state experience in how to engage in Arctic governance. And Arctic governance is not only the Arctic Council, for example. It's a web of, relation, of intricate relationship between Arctic state, non-Arctic states, and non-state actors in the region. So being in the Arctic, going to the Arctic, conducting scientific research, using scientific uh, science diplomacy is of course important, but presence itself in the Arctic is not enough. As a non-Arctic state, and I think Belgium uh, has really a duty, you have to engage in meaningful relationship with like-minded, and this term is even more relevant now, like-minded Arctic countries, non-Arctic countries as well, on specific Arctic matters, and also non-state actors such as uh, indigenous um, uh, political organizations, to not only to justify your presence, but also to legitimize it and to, to, be, to, to just participate in this very broad way in Arctic governance. Um, as I said, but there's no question in my mind or there's no doubt in my mind that Belgium has a relevant role to play in Arctic governance, but it needs to be seen as an honest Arctic actor. And this is where we need to invest more in bilateral relationship, in multilateral relationship at every level of Arctic governance. So you're looking at the multi-level uh, uh, position of Arctic governance. Thank you very much, uh, Romain. Um, my uh, last but not least uh, speaker uh, in the panel is uh, Mr. Paul De Witte, who is Director General of the Egmont Institute, uh, who actually took the initiative to organize uh, this uh, panel. Um, the Egon Institute is the Royal Institute of International Relations of Belgium. It's a very renowned uh, think tank in Belgium that works very closely together with the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has mandated Egmont uh, to uh, elaborate or assist in elaborating a Belgium uh, Arctic uh, strategy. And uh, Director um, General De Witte, he is, is a brand new uh, Director General of the Institute, just a couple of, of weeks. He's a Belgium career diplomat, uh, having been, among others, uh, Belgium uh, uh, ambassador to, to Denmark. And just before his current position, he served the last six years as the Secretary General or His Majesty the King of Belgium. Paul, you have the floor. And my question to you is, um, why does Egmont, uh, in helping to shape an Arctic future, uh, strategy uh, qualifies already now Belgium as a key Arctic stakeholder. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Marianne. Um, well, um, I, I thank you for having mentioned that um, I'm brand new, <laughs> uh, so bear with me. I don't have much um, value added in this, in this very uh, uh, good panel. Um, but um, in any case, um, Egmont has um, taken up this, uh, this role, this responsibility uh, at the request of the foreign ministry. And so and now I'm borrowing an expression used this morning at the plenary. Uh, in this uh, uh, respect, uh, Egmont is not only a think tank, but a do tank. And um, really doing more than what a think tank normally is supposed to do. And I'm very grateful um, to, uh, to the Foreign Ministry and in the first place to, uh, to Marianne and to Karen van Loon, who is sitting here, that they have, um, over the last uh, half year, um, established um, a timeline and a program of action for the, for the next um, year or so. Um, so. So we are, in fact, developing this, this work um, since a couple of months only. The work has started just before summer. And I'm, I'm glad that um, thanks to uh, these two ladies and thanks to the help of the foreign ministry, we were able to set up this, this panel today and the scientific uh, symposium mentioned by uh, Frank Arnauts, who has been instrumental also from Norway, from, from his posting in Oslo, to, uh, to do uh, the, the necessary work in preparing all this. So this is just um, the beginning of, uh, I, I would hope, a very, uh, very, very uh, elaborate uh, program of, of work, uh, not only in uh, a work uh, consisting in establishing a number of, of elements of a, of a strategy, 
but also, um, in fact, conveying to, uh, in fact, to the outside world, both public uh, in, in Belgium as uh, internationally, that Belgium has a role to play. And this is clearly a, a first emanation or second after the symposium. So this is, this is, I think, as important as putting up this action. Um, it is true that uh, this policy of this uh, elaboration of a, of a Belgian um, Arctic policy is long overdue. And I'm, I'm happy that um, individuals have not waited for a strategy to start working and uh, start working on, on polar um, scientific cooperation already uh, since the end of the 19th century. And as uh, my, my neighbor here has mentioned, we have an excellent basis of scientific cooperation. And it's good that we have uh, been able um, to, uh, to give this, uh, this the, in fact, this, I would say this, these efforts a podium, um, a stage three weeks ago in Brussels. The, uh, I think the work uh, is going on. There's another very important, um, I would say, uh, uh, program of actions which is, which is uh, upcoming. The scientific is one of the elements which is already well in place. The economic is the next. Mm -hmm. uh, what is mentioned is, is, is by, by my colleagues here at the table is that we have good know-how, good expertise in a number of uh, sectors, uh, to mention a, f a few, uh, shipping, ports, energy, extraction, uh, um, trans energy transport, um, uh, dredging and engineering. So these are all uh, sectors where Belgian uh, enterprises have good expertise and experience and experience also in working in difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the second uh, strand of, of this policy. And, and the, the third being, of course, the, the security, both human security as security as a whole. Um, we live in a, in a very unstable world, more and more. And um, it, it is only, I think, logic that we will also look into this, that our defense uh, and security uh, people will also further look into this as they have been doing already in international frameworks as NATO. But uh, with the Belgica II, which is a scientific vessel, but which is also uh, a very important tool for the Belgian defense, uh, we will be able also to, uh, to do our deal also in, in this respect, in, in, uh, in fact, contributing to, uh, to security for the, for the region. It was mentioned as well uh, that we as Belgium have always had a tradition of working alongside EU and NATO. I'm happy that Clara is in this team as well. So we have played our role during these, um, I would say, couple of last decades working already uh, on Arctic matters, but within international and multilateral frameworks. Uh, but um, as Cla Clara uh, clearly mentioned, it is good that uh, the work of the, of the EU and the work of, of member states go hand in hand. We are complementary and it is it's just normal that the, the EU is not working in, in a kind of vacuum but is reinforcing uh, the work uh, done by, by individual member states. So I leave it to this. This is more like, um, I'd say, a kind of summary, uh, but I think this, this is... Um, I think at this moment, the best I can do, and I'm happy for a very, uh, very good members of this panel for their uh, contributions. And th thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, and I like very much that you say we are a do tank, uh, beside being a think tank. Uh, and I'm, I'm particularly also grateful that you highlighted the elements mentioned here. Science economic file will be the next big, big project, but also that you mentioned the security. Belgium has this year, for the very first time, uh, a national uh, security strategy, and uh, this new and security strategy mentioned explicitly the Arctic, and we have a, a big interest from our uh, defense ministry uh, as well. We have about now 15 minutes uh, left, and uh, I would like to ask a quick uh, supplementary question to the panelists, and I really ask them to ask uh, to reply uh, in uh, with two minutes, if it's uh, possible, a maximum. I will start uh, with, with uh, Frank, um, that uh, we, we are living in very uh, turbulent and geopolitical uh, times for the moment. So what, what might be the impact of this uh, environment on uh, 
uh, the uh, Belgium's engagement in the Arctic? Yes, I think this is a very, very valid qu uh, question, and it's resounding for the past days everywhere in this conference. Uh, if we want to be less dependent uh, from Russia in the given political context, and perhaps even also less dependent uh, from the uh, dominance of China in, in global economics, um, so the, the push is coming from geopolitics, but I think the answer for, in a large extent will be uh, through e economic cooperation and, and probably more regional economic cooperation. And from a Belgian point of view, this goes to, as I mentioned before, in the direction of the North Sea, but also further north, beyond the North Sea, Norwegian Sea, Arctic Sea, the nor northeastern part of the Atlantic Ocean is seen by many Belgian eyes for the moment as a kind of new economic powerhouse where that Belgium is orienting itself to. And, and the main driver at this moment is indeed the look, looking for fields of cooperation in renewable energy. I mentioned the fact that we do, in a very small space of 65 kilometers of coast, an enormous output of renewable energy. And then, therefore, we would like really get into dialogue with the countries around those mari maritime areas I mentioned, including the Arctic, to see where we can cooperate. I listened very well to what the, the Prime Minister of Greenland yesterday said, is that if we want to cooperate, yes, we are welcome, but it should happen on the terms of the countries and the communities, the indigenous communities, the local communities of the regions. But I think there's a duty from our side, but also from, the, from you know, the, the side of the countries and the regions and the people in the regions, at least to go into dialogue how we can work together to achieve this problem of, uh, of getting answers, enough answers to climate change. And therefore, I think the effort that we, for instance, did in this small part of, of, of North Sea, it should be possible in one way or the other to repeat that also in this region even if there's a great reluctance to, to change the landscape, to, to impact on the pristineness of, of this region, but through dialogue and, and, and seeing how together we can put our shoulders in developing responses against climate change and in the development of renewable energy, I think in this area of North Sea and beyond the North Sea towards the Arctic, I think we can achieve enormous and good results in cooperation, in dialogue and with respect what are the interests of the, the, the local population and the indigenous population. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Clara, which recommendations would you give to Belgium in shaping its own strategy? That, that's a very big question. <laughs> I will not give any recommendations to Belgium, but my, my guess would be that Belgium, in shaping its, its uh, strategy, would again think about what is the sort of uh, specific um, contribution that Belgium can give uh, and, and what is the sort of comparative advantages that, that Belgium has um, and coming back then to this long-standing engagement in, in research, for instance. Um, and then also just take into account uh, the, the, the specific location of Belgium. Uh, the ambassador already touched upon north and south. But I would say uh, that the location is really at the heart of Europe, central to Europe, with, with very um, prime access to decision-making in Brussels, uh, which, which is, uh, I think, a very um, important, uh, actually, atout. Um, but also uh, having, uh, in, in this the geopolitical situation, there is also uh, the proximity to NATO, uh, which, which is very important. So I would suppose that all of this will be important elements when Belgium is shaping its uh, national strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very grateful for this, this reply, uh, Clara. Uh, Professor Philippe Hulbrechts, you mentioned already several areas in, in which uh, Belgium as uh, Arctic uh, science uh, is active, but would you say, mention one of the sector where Belgium really excels compared uh, with uh, your colleagues in, in other fields? 
Well, yeah, I would say that Belgium has many excellent uh, research groups in polar research, of course, but um, if, if I were to pick out a few highlights, um, I, I, I would uh, take the Belgian contributions to geophysical modeling of components of the Arctic climate system. Uh, so, uh, in developing numerical models uh, used in the fields of glaciology and climatology. And, and I will just mention a few groups that are active there. Uh, there's a group at uh, the UCL, Université Catholique de Louvain, who, are, who have developed a sea ice model. It's called LIM. It's, uh, it's a model that is very uh, uh, much used and standard in many other climate models and uh, actively used for Arctic sea ice. Um, we also have a very strong expertise in ice sheet modeling. Uh, in Belgium, and in fact, the Greenland ice sheet model that was developed at the uh, Free University of Brussels was, uh, in fact, the first of its kind, and it has been uh, heavily used uh, for projecting the contribution of the Greenland ice sheet to sea level change. For instance, in uh, successive IPCC uh, scientific uh, assessments, uh, we also have a, a very strong group in Liège uh, who are using a regional climate model. It's called MAR that is uh, uh, used to, uh, to model the mass balance of the Greenland ice sheets. And this is an absolutely world-top model. Uh, has led to many publications in uh, prestigious journals uh, such as Nature uh, and, uh, and, and Science. So I, 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 I think if you ask me that the, uh, uh, the, the excellence is in modeling of the, the, the climate system. Thank you very much, Professor Hulbrecht. Uh, I read also, based on some information that uh, Ambassador uh, Anos had given, that in the University of Liège, uh, that they are working uh, on a project for having thousands of windmills in Greenland, and then particularly to see how to get this electricity, uh, this uh, energy to get to the, the European uh, continent. It's a, it's a mega uh, world project uh, which is being examined by the University of, of, of Liège. Um, Nicolas, you, you mentioned the, uh, the very impressive expertise that we have already on Antarctica. Is there anything that what we what is being done in Antarctica uh, can be a model, uh, can be an inspiration for uh, what we could do in the Arctic? The short answer is yes, <clears throat> uh, but I'll elaborate a very little bit. Yes, of course, there's no reason why we as a, what, what we did as a small team in, in, a, in a small country, but ambitious country, uh, cannot be replicated by other people, although it's not a plug and play, right? Um, so I think if, if I want to briefly answer the question, I would think it on, on, on two levels, really. What, what has driven IPF in achieving what it has done and is driving future very ambitious projects that I will share at the, at the, at the next occasion, is the vision that some people in the foundation have that leads to the development of new environmental technologies, whether it's in-house or with partners. Uh, I'll come back to that. And the second one is really as important as the technology, as the vision and the ambition is, how will that be translated into real life um, you know, technology and implement it. So it's about the structure, it's about the, the organization that you have with you and behind you. Now, very briefly, why was, what was the aim of, what is still the aim of the Princess Elizabeth Antarctic Station is to provide a platform for scientists to be able to do their job um, in a, as pristine environment as possible, right? And how do we do that? And, and the second is to show to the world that you can live in an area without having an impact on the environment. So if we can do it in Antarctica, as I say about New York, uh, we can do it everywhere, I think. And so what, very briefly, what is the Princess Elizabeth Station? It's zero emission. Everything that makes the station run, all the power, is purely 100% from solar and wind energy. Okay? And we even have a bit too much power. So now we're already thinking, because our vision and ambition is not only as it stands today, we also want to improve and to further develop the station. So we're thinking, what can we do with the surplus of energy? We're thinking about hydrogen, producing hydrogen in Antarctica. It's far away, okay? It's not tomorrow. But we also have a new electric vehicle uh, that is, was arrived last year that we, we, we got with the Venturi uh, company in, in Monaco, just to make sure that not only at the station will the results of the scientists not be influenced by possible emissions and pollution, but also when we go on the field, how can we ensure it's pristine and that we protect the environment? So we have many more projects. It is about ambition, and if we can do it in a small team, it can be done 
by other people as well. Now, I just want to briefly highlight as well, it's because it's as important as the technology and the brilliant scient uh, engineers that we have with us, it's about how do you put that in order? How do you make it happen? You need internal stakeholders, which are, of course, the people that you work with, but also, as importantly, is the people that you trust and that you can rely on. It's not always easy, but we have good contacts over the years with the people from the government, the ministries, the cabinets, and people of BELSPO, which is a Belgian science policy office as well. And if, if, if you can you know, make that work, uh, there's no reason, so, so I'm back to the beginning of the answer, yes, it can be done. But these two elements are as important, one and the other. One does not function well without the other. Excellent. Thank you very much. Romain, a, sh a short uh, question. What do you think that Belgium as a non-Arctic state can bring to governance uh, in the Arctic, particularly in the current times? Thank you, Marianne. That's a very big question, but I think I strongly agree with what Ambassador Arnaud said. If we go back to this idea of multi-level, multi-scala engagement, the role of Belgium, what it can bring to Arctic governance, is trying to find common grounds with um, and, and areas of interest and expertise to really highlight that meaningful Arctic collaboration is possible. And um, we've heard from uh, um, His Excellency, sustainable shipping, transportation, energy, those are topical areas where Belgium can actually engage um, and bring his, its expertise to, to the table. And also, it's all about creating an exchange so it's not only what can Belgium bring to Arctic governance, but what also can we learn from Arctic governance and the, and the states already, or the state and non-state actors, already engaged in that governance. So it's about creating this kind of exchange uh, to, because it's, it's relational, as I said. It's, it's multi-level relations that we want to create and engage with. Um, so, and, and creating really this Belgium-Arctic synergy. Um, so, but to do this, and I think that's really important and has been stressed, already, we need a policy. We need a Belgian Arctic policy to have really a coherent, well-funded engagement, a well-funded, sorry, engagement, uh, and then we take it from there. Uh, so that's my short answer. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I take it away that the cohesive uh, engagement Belgium Arctic strategy is, is important. Um, Paul, you actually replied already uh, to, to the question, what are the next steps of uh, the Egmont Institute engagement on the, on the Arctic. I think for the audience it would also be interesting to, to listen. Maybe they have the impression now that the Egmont is only dealing with the Arctic, uh, which it only started, I would say, a few, a few months ago, but maybe that... A few uh, weeks ago. A few weeks ago, but maybe uh, that uh, the other very important research which is being done mm -hmm. uh, by Egmont, how that maybe can contribute also uh, to the shaping of uh, the Belgium Arctic strategy. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, uh, Marianne, for this question. And, and uh, first of all, maybe I, I, I would like to invite you to pick up one of these, these documents you find on, at the tables, um, which are um, very good articles written by Marianne and Karen, or both of them. Uh, one, Europe's Energy and Resource Challenge, the Arctic is part of the solution. The other one, Excellence in Polar Research, how science is putting Belgium more firmly on the map in the Arctic. So th these are very good. Um, articles summarizing or yeah, putting together in, in, in an article what, what Belgium has been doing. Um, there's also, uh, you, maybe if you saw that as well on your table, uh, an invitation to join the group of friends of the Arctic. So um, if you would like to further be informed about what um, Egmont is doing about in the Arctic, um, please um, leave your, your personal data. And this brings me to the, the second, uh, well, the question, in fact, uh, by Marianne. Egmont, what is Egmont doing? Uh, Egmont was created 75 years ago, in 1947. So this is an important uh, landmark, five, 75 years is, is a long time. And um, the, uh, in fact, the, the interesting priorities, the poles, in, in fact, which um, Egmont is working around are uh, Europe, Africa, and um, also uh, the, uh, what we call the Europe in the world is the geopolitical situation. So at least two of these three poles, of th two of these th uh, three programs, in fact, um, can certainly contribute. The one Europe, uh, European um, program is working on, on what Europe is doing. 
the uh, institutions. It will play also an important role in, in helping the foreign ministry in preparing for our presidency of the EU in early 2024, first half of 24. And then, of course, a geopolitical uh, program, uh, Europe in the World, is in fact focusing on uh, what is happening at this moment in the world, Russia in the first place, but also China. And so here you see also a very clear link with the Arctic uh, region. Thank you for this. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that we're coming to the end of our session. We have already, I see, a lot of American friends invading the room. Uh, I would uh, like, uh, in, in the first place, uh, to thank uh, all the, the panelists and the co-organizing co -organizing organizations in, in organizing this premiere, this first pan panel uh, on a Belgium Arctic uh, journal. I particularly would like to thank uh, the audience to be uh, with us, and, and I hope uh, that we could uh, demonstrate that Belgium, by developing its Arctic policy, will have an added a value and demonstrate Belgium's strength in what it can bring uh, to uh, the, the Arctic. I trust that we brought some visibility about our engagement, what we have been uh, doing. And I personally believe we have no reasons to be modest uh, what we have achieved already, what our ambitions are, and then I hope this was a kind of appetizer uh, for hearing more about Belgium's Arctic journey. And I can tell you, we will be back next year in Reykjavik. Thank you very much.